Welcome to a fascinating study on the Trumpets of Revelation. I have prepared more than 500 slides on this subject. From them, I have selected this presentation to help us understand the purpose of the trumpets and how they were fulfilled in history. It is important to understand that during the Middle Ages and the early years of modern times, there was a general consensus regarding the interpretation of the trumpets. But in the 20th century, Protestantism fell into great confusion on the trumpets, and that led to the adoption of other methods of interpretation, such as preterism, futurism, and idealism. While it is good to understand our relation to these various, various interpretations, I can't take time in this presentation to consider the entire history of interpretation. I covered that history in three different books, namely the seals and the trumpets, biblical and historical studies. Another book that I wrote later, The Mystery of the Apocalyptic Trumpets Unraveled, where I simplify and I develop something else. And the, the apocalyptic times of this century, biblical, historical, and astronomical confirmation, where I deal more specifically with, uh, with the days, with the specific days that we find in the fifth and sixth trumpets that we will consider in this series of messages. Let's begin by stating that the trumpets of Revelation deal with people who suffer oppression under the last empire foretold by Daniel, the Roman Empire. The trumpets of Revelation are calls to war in order to hinder the complete dominion of the prince of this world over the entire earth. They are an answer to the outcry of the martyrs. We could say today in our modern language that the trumpets are divine obstructions to the imperial globalization by which the prince of this world plans to take complete control over the planet. The first point that we will consider today has to do with the trumpets in the light of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Let's begin by summarizing what the devil has tried to do throughout the centuries and how God has hindered him from attaining his purpose. We have to catch the specific purpose of the trumpets of Revelation to be sure of their interpretation. We need to consider them first under a wider biblical context in the light of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Then we can look more closely at the specific purpose and application of the trumpets. As a wider biblical context, Let's begin with Christ as the Creator. Satan is the rebellious angel who tried and is still trying to serve the principality of the world that belongs to Christ. This is a cosmic confrontation on this rebellious planet and we have to understand first how that conflict plays out on a global level. The Bible tells us that an angel created by God tried to reach the highest position in heaven. He sought to occupy the very place of God himself. He deceived many of God's loyal angels and was finally expelled from heaven to earth. Here he was able to deceive our first parents. But God would not allow him to gain complete dominion over this world. Since that first confrontation, we see the devil fighting to unite the world in a rebellious empire, and God seeking to organize a united people to reveal his side of the contest. 
this was necessary for everyone in the world to understand God's plan to recover his creation and save the planet. What would the devil do in order to oust God from his creation? We see him in, him in the Bible uh, trying to scatter the people of God. What would God do so that Satan could not attain this purpose? We see God from time to time scattering the empires of the world. What strategy would the devil use to scatter the people of God? Since God protects those who are faithful, the first step in this demonic enterprise would be to lead the people of God into disobedience. But God is merciful, and in order to protect his people and keep them united, he would allow them the opportunity for repentance through the ministry of his prophets. Satan, and Satan, of course, would seek to prevent this. Once he had led God's people to fall into apostasy, the devil would then stir up the nations to invade and destroy God's people so that the plan of salvation for this world would totally and irreversibly fail. How does God intervene to maintain his merciful plan of redemption? He saves a faithful remnant and destroys the enemy empire. After the flood, God saved a family and a remnant of his original creation. As the centuries passed, but the world was still young, the devil tried again to unite the world at Babel. We are living today in an old and dilapidated world. But at that time, there were many lands and continents to discover. It was then that we see for the first time after the flood, God's obstruction of the purposes of Satan. God comes to scatter men from the city and tower they were building. He did it by confusing their language so that they could not understand each other or reach any agreement regarding their plans. The Bible says, this is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth, Genesis 11, verse 9. The next story of the Bible has to do with the divine call of a specific man, Abraham, through whom God proposed to bless the world with the message of the gospel. In this call to Abraham lies the basic principle of background of the trumpets of Revelation. A second point to be considered today in our study is the trumpets in the context of the covenant between God and his people. God called to Abraham and told him, leave your country and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Genesis chapter 12. According to this, to this divine call, the trumpets could be considered in general terms as curses or woes against those who curse the true people of God. The centuries went by, and for the first time, a numerous people gathered in the wilderness to learn the plans of God for their future. Through Moses, their leader and legislator, the Lord repeated the same promise to bless his people in return for their willing obedience. In the book of Deuteronomy, we read in chapter 28, verse 1 and 7, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. 
all these blessings will come upon you. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. Even if the people were suffering dispersion because of their sins, the Lord promised to bless them again through repentance. The curse would mean dispersion. The blessing would mean gathering. In chapter 30, verse, verse 3, we read, Then the Lord will bring you back and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Had, what would happen to the enemies who mistreated the Lord's people? We read in verse 7 that God would avenge their blood. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. Through the prophet Isaiah, we see that at the trumpet blast, God promises to redeem his people from the nations where they had been dispersed and gather them again in their own land. This would be a second exodus, this time from Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. In that day, says the Lord in chapter 27, verse 13, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driving out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. We find here three key concepts, punishment, redemption, gathering. The trumpet will be blown as a punishment to the oppressive empire and as redemption for the remnant of God's people. That blessing involves a return to their land. Now is the time to emphasize the principal purpose of the trumpets. It has to do with a third point in our study. It has to do with a divine answer to the cried of the people of God. Let's look closer at the message of the trumpets in the book of Revelation. The trumpets are seen in the Bible as an answer to the outcry of God's people. What did the people of Israel do when they were suffering under Egyptian bondage? We read in Exodus 2, verse 23 and 24, that they groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant. God looked on the Israelites and took knowledge of them. The next text says that God remembered his covenant. What covenant did God remember the one promised to Abraham their father? We would bless them with grace after they repented and offered obedience to his laws. He then cursed the enemies and in order to fulfill his covenant he raised a deliverer called Moses. The divine deliverance took place in the form of plagues. Keep in mind that the trumpets of Revelation may also be related to plagues, as we may see in, in Revelation 9.20. Again, the people cried out when they were being oppressed for, by foreign nations during the time of the judges. We are told in Judges 6, verse 6, that they cried out to the Lord for help, and God gave them another deliverer, this time Gideon, who saved his people at the trumpet blast. Gideon. The divine answer to the outcry of his people came later under the first king of Israel. The Lord said in uh, 1 Samuel 9:16. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. This is the pattern that we see repeated throughout the whole Bible. Let's offer another example found in 2 Chronicles 
32, verse 20, and Isaiah 37 and 36. King Ezekiah and the prophet Isaiah cried out in prayer to heaven under a Syrian threat, and the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men. At this point, it is useful to keep in mind that we also have a deliverer today. He is our Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers us all from our sins and protects us from our enemies. The hand of God to protect his people is not shortened today. In this context, let's return to the book of Revelation. We hear in the fifth seal the outcry of the martyrs that suffer under the last world empire in its different forms. John wrote in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, that they cried out under the altar in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? The answer to their outcry is seen in the seventh seal that is portrayed in Revelation 8, 2 to 5. John says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. They came, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. The seventh seal is the seal of God, and it has to do with the way God answers the outcry of his people down through the centuries. The prayers of those who suffer tribulation reach the golden altar of the heavenly sanctuary, and a precious uh, perfume representing the righteousness of Christ is added to their prayers to be accepted before God. God answers them, not only giving them peace in the conflict, but also calling foreign armies to undermine the power of the Roman Empire so that the message of the followers of the Lord cannot be totally quenched. Actually, we find, we find peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, etc. at the end of the plagues, at the end of the trumpets, at the end of the seals, as is the case here, and at the end of the messages to the churches in the vision of the throne. Finally, when the seventh seal that belongs to God is opened, the heavenly court reviews the way God has fulfilled his promise of protecting his people that was made in his covenant. This is necessary to show that God did not forget his people in the midst of their troubles. He was with his people along the way until the end of the world, when the final and definitive trumpet blast will destroy the opposing empire forever. In the book of Revelation, Christ reveals himself as the deliverer of his people during the entire Christian era. He does it by undermining the power of the oppressing empire during the first six trumpets, then destroying forever at the last trumpet the intolerant kingdom of Rome. As a matter of fact, in the end, he will deliver us again with his heavenly army at the seventh and last trumpet. In the last battle of Armageddon, we will behold him coming with his army of angels, blasting the last trumpet to destroy the nations of the world who are gathered to wage war against him. In Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16, John states that with justice he judges and makes war. He added then in his depiction that the armies of heaven were following him. Likewise, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52, 
that we will all be changed at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. At this time, the nations will not be converted. They will be deceived again by the devil. This is the reason why Jesus warned that all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Matthew 34 verses 30 and 31. Are you ready to consider the fourth point of our message? It has to do with a no less important subject. The trumpets are also judgments of God that intend to alleviate and end the tribulation. In ancient Israel, God intervened again and again to deliver his people from oppressive empires. God had given his people a wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. No doubt, many foreign nations would covet this land. And he had chosen a land in which to reveal his glory and he promised to protect it. It was his dwelling place. There he placed his project of salvation for the whole world. Would not the devil try to usurp that chosen land to impose his dominion over the throne of God? Of course. The greatest empires who opposed the kingdom of God and caused tribulations were the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Middle Persians. Through Moses, God delivered his people from the Egyptians. They were tried later when the Assyrians invaded their land. But an angel intervened to deliver the Jews from the Assyrian kingdom. And it is true that the moment came when God wanted nothing to do with his people and delivered them to the Babylonians. But through his servants, he revealed his glory and sovereignty over that great empire in the very court of that kingdom. At that time of Esther, for instance, a great liberation took place this time under the Middle Persian threat. To all the empires of the world, God gave an opportunity to reveal their true character. All of them were given a time to reach maturity and bear their fruit. In the critical moments when these empires rose up against God to completely annihilate his people, the Lord intervened and saved them. The question now is, how would the Lord deliver his people in the Christian era from the last oppressive empire? This guidance was lacking until God revealed it to his apostles in the book of Revelation. In the visions of Daniel, the last empire is Rome. It followed the Greek empire of Alexander the Great, Rome was the predominant kingdom in the days of Jesus and the apostles. This is the reason why the prophecies of the New Testament, and especially those of the last book of the Bible, begin their prophecies with Rome. Let's read what Ellen G. White wrote about Rome and its relation to the new Israel, the Christian church of the first centuries. It is found in her book, The Great Controversy, page 438. The line of prophecy in which these symbols, Revelation 13, are found begins in Revelation 12, with the dragon that sought to destroy Christ at his birth. The dragon is said to be Satan, Revelation 12, 9. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which uh, paganism was the prevailing religion. 
Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. And it is the dragon who gives his power and authority to the Roman Antichrist in the 6th century. Revelation 13, verse 3 and 4. In Revelation, the trumpets are seven judgments against Rome, the last empire that persecutes the saints in three different phases and moments. Differing from other former empires, the Roman kingdom would develop three different levels of oppression, inflicting on the people of God three apocalyptic tribulations. Keep this in mind. This was clearly revealed in the visions of Daniel. The first two moments were already fulfilled. Pagan realm from the first to the fifth centuries and papal realm from the sixth to the eighteenth century. The latter was known as the Holy Roman Empire. But the last attempt of the devil to destroy God's revelation to the world is still in the future. In fact, it is currently underway and progressing rapidly. It has to do with a Babylonian global civil religious union under papal leadership. That union will cause the final tribulation to the last remnant of the people of God. Let's consider briefly the first tribulation caused by pagan Rome. I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 1, 9. We have here four key words or statements. Tribulation, patient, endurance, word of God, and testimony of Jesus. These statements shows us that God tests our strength and integrity by allowing us to pass through tribulations. Those who do not rebel against God under tribulation are quite patient as a result. Says the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 verse 3, Let us rejoice in our tribulations, sufferings. Because we know that tribulation produces patience or perseverance. On one occasion, I visited a lady with several problems. I met with her and her husband for several hours, almost till midnight. Finally, she said, I was requesting God to give me patience. But I am now realizing that he will not send me patience by mail wrapped in a box. The more I ask God for patience, the more problems I have. It would be better for me to surrender my will to his will and to accept the yoke of Christ. There are things that we can change. But there are other things that we cannot change and need to learn to bear. We need to ask God to give us discernment to distinguish between these two realities. Even the Son of God had to learn obedience through what he suffered, Hebrews 5, verse 8. In order to become the suffering servant of the prophecy and understand our situation, he submitted to the will of his Father and left us an example of how to overcome in facing our tribulations. To the church of Smyrna, Jesus said in Revelation 2.10, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer tribulation. Be faithful. Was Jesus suggesting here that nothing would happen to them? No. He simply said, be faithful, even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. In verses 8 and 9, he added, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, 
who died and came to life again. I know your tribulations and your poverty, yet you are rich. The Apostle Paul testified in 1 Corinthians 4, 9 that God has put us, that is, the Christians in his day, on display, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. This means that through Christ and his disciples and even through us, God unmasked the true character of our great enemy before the whole universe. At the same time, God reveals the character of Jesus Christ reproduced in his followers, even in the face of adversity. One of the Christians in the third century said to the Romans, You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Nor does your cruelty avail you. The oftener we are mound down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Jesus hath said, He who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 10, 22. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, said David, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Those who have to face death are more concerned about knowing that the Lord is with them than they are on the outcome of uh, their situation. We may say in such circumstances, O oh Lord, if your will is for me to die, be with me at this painful moment. Keep me together, for this is all for me. Because we know what Jesus said before the death of Lazarus and believe his words. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. John 11, 25. The first four trumpets of Revelation concern the invasions of the German or barbarian tribes against the heathen Roman Empire. Because of the tribulations Rome had inflicted on his people during the first centuries of the Christian era. These invasions began in the first century in the days of John and uh, climaxed with the fall of the Roman Empire in the fourth and fifth centuries. God answered the outcry of the first tribulation produced by the hidden Roman Empire by means of the first four trumpets. The second tribulation is part of the fifth seal. Notice this placement in the fifth seal, not in the first or the last one. That locates it in the Middle Ages. John wrote, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had, Revelation 6.10. Their faith was equivalent to the faith of Job under tribulation when he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, John chapter 19. The martyrs of the Middle Ages died because of the testimony they had. John doesn't say here because of the testimony of Jesus. He wrote in Revelation 19 verse 10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. During the Middle Ages, the martyrs of Jesus had the word of God, but not the gift of prophecy. In her book, The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White wrote about that time. The mangled form of millions of martyrs caused by the Roman Holy Office under the Inquisitorial Courts, created by the popes in the 13th century. These martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. Great Controversy, page 59. Under papal supremacy during the Holy Roman Empire, 
The world was witness to the true followers of Jesus as they were burned alive at the stake. This happened during what we call the Middle Ages. Their leaders were burned alive at the stake, often hundreds at a time. The most horrendous crimes were perpetrated at that time. John saw that the woman, that is the Roman apostate church, nicknamed Babylon, was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who had the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 17, verse 6. Let us notice that the sixth trumpet falls upon the great river Euphrates, Revelation 9, 14. That is upon Babylon. The river is a symbol of persecution carried out through the dwellers of the earth. Isaiah 8, verses 7 and 8, Revelation 12, 15. Con answer the outcry of the martyrs of the Middle Ages through the two Islamic invasions, the Saracens, the Ottoman Turks. Through the Islamic Empire, the power of Rome and their papal predominance was held in check. Her authority was restrained to allow the survival of a remnant of the true faith. The third tribulation will be caused by the resurrection of the papal political religious power. It has to do with the arrival of the last great apostasy, a new great Babylon. It comprehends the union of all the churches and states of the world. John wrote in Revelation 12, 17, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring those who obey God's commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. We are warned in the book of Prophets and Kings, pages 587 and 588, that as he, that is the devil, influenced the hidden nations to destroy Israel, so in the near future he will stir up the wicked powers of earth to destroy the people of God. This was anticipated by the last part of the Statue of the Nations, according to the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. The union of church and state is restored at the end, with its intolerant characteristic of the Middle Ages toward the minorities that refuse to cooperate with that world system. That union will cause the final tribulation. In Revelation 14, verse 12, we read, here is the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you remember how the saints learn patience? Through tribulation. The last tribulation results in the triumph of righteousness, the blasting of the seventh and the last trumpet the definitive punishment of God against the empire of evil that now fills the whole earth. At that time, wrote Daniel in the last chapter of his book, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will stand up. There will be a time of distress such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people... Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Daniel 12, verse 1. Let us deal now with the fifth point. The trumpets are a manifestation of God's wrath. In Jeremiah 51, verse 27, the Lord says, Blow the trumpet among the nations announced the prophet Jeremiah, prepare the nations for war against her, Babylon. Summon against her the kingdoms. Appoint a marshal against her. Bring up horses like bristling locusts. Three key words are implied here that we will encounter again in our study of the trumpets of Revelation. Those three implied words are Trumpet, locusts, empire. God stirred up the nations to punish the Babylonian empire that caused the tribulation of his people. No wonder John is 
John in the book of Revelation quotes so often from the book of Jeremiah. Through these trumpets or calls to war, God avenges the blood of his people. In the old dispensation, the trumpets were a manifestation of the wrath of God for what his enemies did to Jerusalem, his holy city. We read this in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 35 and 38. The violence done to me and to my kinsmen be upon Babylon. Behold, I will plead your cause and take vengeance for you. They shall row together like lions. The last confrontation between God and the devil will be a manifestation of the wrath of God, now discharged without mercy, and the wrath of the dragon would, who makes war against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 12, 17. The wrath of the nations is stirred up by the wrath of the dragon, Revelation 11:18. This, in turn, calls for the last place in the seventh and last trumpet, which consummate the wrath of God. In Revelation, the last empire, Rome, is represented by the symbol of Babylon, which receives seven consecutive trumpet blows to curtail her power and is finally destroyed completely at the last trumpet. This is the seven plagues that complete the wrath of God. At the seventh trumpet said the voices of heaven, the nations were angry, and your wrath, that is the wrath of God, has come, Revelation 11, 18. The wrath of God in the seventh trumpet is completed in the seven plagues. In Revelation 15, 1, we read, I saw seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. Let us emphasize this point. The trumpets are a manifestation of the wrath of God. That wrath is initially restrained by a degree of mercy, but it intensifies through the last three vows until its consummation in the last trumpet, the seventh one. What are we seeing in the world today? Everything points to a kingdom of war and terror. We are living in a culture of wrath and death. Drones, robots, animals, human beings, insects, all of them are equipped to kill and destroy. This is an apocalyptic picture that the Bible calls Armageddon. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, says the apostle. The seventh plague falls upon the great Babylon, Rome, a symbol of Rome. The greatest earthquake in history takes place at the end. Revelation 16:9 says, the great city split into three parts. Does this destroy the final rebellion of Mother Babel? John adds, the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. Revelation 16, 19 and 20. The Lord with his angels come to fight the last battle which is portrayed in Revelation 19. His angels blast the trumpet. John wrote, with justice his judges and wages war. Let's summarize the three tribulations and how God responded at the right moment. The first tribulation, punishments against pagan imperial Rome. They are for punishment. The second tribulation, we find punishments against the apostate Christian Rome. There are two punishments. And the third tribulation is the final punishment against Rome and the world. 
one and last punishment. Are you scared? We know that there is still a tribulation, the last one. But this time, the one who comes in person to rescue his sheep is none other than the true pastor of the flock, the very creator and redeemer of the universe. Through Ezekiel, he said, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks upon the, after his scattered flock, when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Ezekiel 34, verse 11 and 12. Now, the time has come for a decision. Do we want to belong to the flock of the Lord today? Do we want to be protected from the wrath of the devil who steers the wrath of the nations at the end? Are we ready to face the wrath of God who comes to destroy this world for its iniquities? Could I see the hands of those who want to side with the Lord in the last contest? Amen. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you because we want to belong to your flock. We want to belong to your church, to that last red man, remnant that keeps the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and have the testimony of Jesus. We want to be protected by you. We want to be protected by your persons by through your angels, especially in connection with the last wrath that will come from heaven in the last place. We want to be protected from the world, from the last empire, oppressing empire, and from the Lord, from yourself in your last wrath. Give us your spirit in order to be converted to your law, to keep your commandments, and give us the faith that we need in order to overcome. In Jesus' name, we ask you these things. Amen.